Um, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'm very excited to introduce you to our Department of Physics at Northeastern. Um, for the next hour, we will be having a discussion. You'll hear from our faculty um, within the department, as well as some of our amazing students and as well as our um, co-op faculty advisor. So I hope you came with all your questions throughout this presentation. At any time, you can use the Q&A feature um, in the chat box um, on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have questions for an individual, that's perfectly fine. Or if they are general questions, you can ask there too. And then at the end, we'll open it up for our live Q&A session so you can hear um, more from our folks. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over um, to our chair of the physics department, Dr. Mark Williams. Hi, Mark. How are you this evening? Great. Thanks for introducing me. Um, so yeah, it's great to, uh, to be able to talk to you. And uh, I just wanted to first introduce myself. So um, my background is uh, condensed matter physics. I studied superfluid helium for my PhD, uh, but I'm actually a biological physicist. I study, uh, I take, uh, use an instrument called optical tweezers and stretch uh, single DNA molecules using optical tweezers and study DNA and RNA protein interactions. We study viral replication, which is obviously a very important topic these days. And we've even uh, done some studies of the coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, replication uh, proteins. Um, and, um, and so I'm happy to talk to you about the physics department. Uh, we're not all doing biological physics. We have a huge range of uh, research areas and I'll get into that in a little bit, but this introductory slide gives you some pictures to kind of show you um, what, uh, what the department is like. And I have this quote from the American Physical Society trying to define what physics is. It's one of the hardest fields to define because it's so broad. It says physics is crucial to understanding the world around us, the world inside us and the world beyond us is the most basic and fundamental science. So you learn very basic fundamental things things about how to apply mathematics to the physical world. Uh, and you use that on lots of different things. And so some of these pictures, um, these are a couple of our students who uh, were working at the Large Hadron uh, Collider um, in uh, Switzerland. And uh, we have a lot of uh, faculty and students that work on the CMS detector, one of the two main detectors of, uh, of the LHC. Um, and, uh, and actually the middle uh, uh, picture is a is a, uh, a diagram of some collisions uh, that have been modeled uh, that occurred within the uh, CMS detector. Um, at the top is a couple of copies of uh, Laszlo Barabasi's The Formula, which is uh, one of the many books that he's written about network science. So he studies network science, lots of different networks and how they interact. And that one is the formula, the network formula for how to be successful or what makes successful people. Um, and uh, in the lower left, we have Meni Wanunu, who's actually an expert on the technology involved in DNA sequencing and is working on doing next generation DNA sequencing. Um, uh, in the upper right, we have a student working on a condensed matter physics experiment, materials physics uh, in an ultra high vacuum um, apparatus. And then finally, on the lower right, we have a diagram of a network that uh, is one of the examples of what people study. So this gives you an idea of the array of things that we have studied. So what is the, the physics department like? We have um, 36 tenure and tenure track professors. So what that means is that 36 of our faculty members have active research uh, labs, either their labs like experimental labs or groups uh, if they're doing theory, uh, computational group, things like that. Uh, so, um, so there are 36 uh, research groups or so research groups that people can join for undergraduate research. Um, we have 100 graduate students and 25 postdoctoral associates. Postdoctoral associates are people who have finished their PhD and are doing additional training. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of how populated our labs are. So many of the of the research labs have, say, three or four graduate students and a, and a postdoc or two, uh, and um, and undergraduate students. And we typically have a lot of undergraduates working in the labs as well, and so they join a group that has people of different levels that they can learn from uh, in their research areas. Um, we have a, a total of 100 undergraduate students, approximately, uh, this is our latest numbers, but uh, about 100 undergraduate students in the physics majors, plus another 200 students in combined majors with physics. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, physics majors. So that means that if you join the department, you join a really big group 
uh, of, of students that you can get to know and that can, and you can talk to and get to know and they can help you and help you advance in, in your in what you want to do. Um, and actually, I was just looking up at the American Institute of Physics keeps track of this and only 4% of physics departments graduate more than 20 uh, majors per year. So we're in the top 4% in terms of the size of the undergraduate physics majors. And so I said 100 undergraduate students in physics majors and 200 in combined majors. So what we call the physics majors are listed here. There's the BS in physics, the BS in biomedical physics, and the BS in applied physics. So those are the, 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 the majors based just in physics. Uh, and then we have a lot of um, combined majors with um, electrical and chemical engineering, chemical engineering, uh, electrical and computer engineering, chemical engineering, computer science, environmental sciences, music, and even philosophy. Um, and I didn't mention, um, but uh, with the, the majors, the physics majors, you, we also have a, a, a new concentration in astrophysics under development. So that by under development, we mean that it's going through the process of approval right now, but we actually created uh, several new astrophysics courses. So we already have developed and created the courses needed for an astrophysics concentration as part of the physics major. So if you join, you'll be able to do an astrophysics concentration as part of the major and all the courses needed for that will be offered. And finally, at the graduate level, uh, this is uh, webinars for undergraduates, but we do have some uh, graduate degrees where you can transition from the BS to an MS in physics called the plus one. Uh, there's also just a, a, a BS, MS in physics uh, and ECE. So you and combined with ECE, again, electrical and computer engineering. And there's even a BS PhD in physics where if you want to transition to the PhD at Northeastern after your BS, uh, by signing up early and taking a few classes early, you can, you can cut about a year off of the PhD program. Uh, although most of the PhD is research and you can't cut any time off of that part of it. Um, and then we also have uh, MS in physics, applied physics and engineering, and of course the PhD in physics. And so uh, the research in, in physics at Northeastern, we have a lot of different fields and, um, oh, sorry, I, I, I meant to, to point out these, uh, the pictures. So the lower left uh, is Alex Vespignani. And so you may have seen his name. He's been in the news a lot because his lab is one of the five labs that was advising the CDC on the coronavirus outbreak. He's an expert on disease outbreaks, on network science, but really in modeling disease outbreaks. He was one of the main experts studying Ebola when those outbreaks were important. And now that COVID, uh, the COVID outbreak is, so, uh, is worldwide, uh, that is, um, that's the main thing that he's been working on. Uh, and then many Wanunu, I already mentioned doing uh, DNA sequencing, and that's one of his graduate students working with him in the lab. And that's Latika Menon at the top, who has developed uh, filters and actually spun off a company uh, to uh, purify water and make filters for purifying water. Um, and so just a little bit more about the research uh, areas. Uh, so we have what's called condensed matter physics, which is like materials physics, uh, and nanophysics, again, nanoparticles and, and nanomaterials. And then finally, quantum materials in that sort of general research area. So one of the main focuses uh, of research in the department is on quantum materials. Those are materials being developed for uh, quantum computers, for example, or other, um, uh, other types of sensors and development of uh, electronic uh, devices. Um, we even hired a, a professor recently who is using quantum sensors to study biology. And so he uses what are called NV centers, which are probably going to be uh, one of the components of um, quantum computers, but he actually is using them to try to develop nuclear magnetic resonance at the single molecule level uh, by using these NV quantum sensors to sense uh, biological molecules. Uh, and that brings us to biological physics, another focus area of the department. That's my field um, and the field of, of, other, of several other faculty. We have uh, people who study um, the molecular level systems like myself, and then people who also study cellular level and, and tissue level materials. Um, and, uh, and then we I mentioned already the network science faculty. Uh, and they are some of the best in the world, definitely the best in the country. Uh, some of the original originators of the field of network science, Laszlo Barabasi, uh, is an example of that. 
Um, and we also have elementary particle physics and we have slash astroparticle physics slash astrophysics. So those are all variations of a similar thing. Uh, the, I mentioned the Large Hadron Collider, so the collider particle physics people. Uh, we have a several uh, faculty members who do research in collider particle physics. We just hired a faculty member who does astroparticle physics, trying to detect dark matter in on-ground experiments by detecting things coming from space and colliding with on-ground detectors. That's astroparticle physics. And then astrophysics is looking at uh, galaxies far away and figuring out what they're doing and modeling them mathematically and so we also have faculty members working in astrophysics and we're hiring more in that area. So that's one of the areas of expansion uh, in the department. So those are the main uh, research areas. In terms of grants, all of this research has to be funded uh, by external grants. And so we typically, among the, the faculty members doing all this research, have about $12 million a year coming in in new grants. Uh, so there's a lot of research being funded uh, in the department, and that means that there are labs that you can join that can pay you to do a co-op within the lab. Um, uh, Steve Savitsky will talk in a little bit more later uh, more about co-ops, but one option is to do a co-op in a research lab on campus, and there are a lot of options available. And of course, uh, students who do co-ops in, in labs or research in labs can uh, become part of publications, and I actually had uh, so I have several of my students who have published papers as part of uh, work in my lab. Um, and so I think with that, uh, we're going to go next to uh, Professor Brian Spring, who's going to talk about physics student services and other aspects of uh, the, the, from the viewpoint of, of students, what, um, what's available to you. Brian? Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Brian Spring. I'm a professor of biomedical physics, so under the biological physics category in, in the department. And... Um, my uh, story is starting off as a physics major, plain physics with a minor in art, and then going on to um, biophysics, then going even further and doing a postdoc at Mass General Hospital focused on cancer research and optics. And so I've, I've come back home to physics, and my group now works on discovering new photomedicines for very nasty advanced stage cancers and trying to reduce the morbidity of the disease, improve the tolerance of the treatment, and also the efficacy to try to overcome these you know, terrible diseases. We build miniature microscopes. We also build our own pulse lasers. So there's some cool um, physics involved in all of that. And so get, moving on here to the physics student services, um, a couple points here that are important for you to know that there are faculty advisors within the department, plus you have your co-op and college of science advisors. And these people can help custom design your um, curriculum to kind of fit your needs, get, get your co-op fit in in a timely way and um, help you fit in a minor um, to accommodate other interests that you may have to get the most out of the physics curriculum. Um, you should also come in knowing that there are fellowships and awards available. So there's actually money in the department to give out to um, uh, freshmen, sophomores coming in. And it's never too early to get involved. I've had several people come into the lab as freshmen and just get their feet wet. And some of them are able to win some of these fellowships. And it's a nice, nice thing to get a little bit of money back. Uh, there's also teaching fellowships that are available for um, senior undergraduates. It's another opportunity. I guess we can go to the next slide, Mark. You would. And then a really important thing is the Society of Physics Students. So this is a very vibrant community. There are faculty lead advisors to help facilitate this. And it's really run by a strong core of leadership um, among students. And it's a great place to go to get to know people, um, to learn about co-ops, get exposure to co-ops. They do a weekly seminar where they invite faculty and students to actually talk about their co-op experiences. So a great thing. And there's also fun social events built into that. And you'll hear a little bit more. We have Jennifer and Annika here that can speak more to their experiences with the society. Jennifer is actually the president. And I think let's go to the next slide, Mark, please. And just to give you an idea of some of the fun social events, um, we have a, a 
pie day baking contest. There's a chili cook-off where people compete to make the best chili. And we have a, we have a, you know, it's, it's a voting system where everyone votes. Um, there's also network and career panels that can help you, again, um, learn about co-op opportunities and research lab um, opportunities. There's a woman physics group that's, you know, a great place for support and growth. And with that, I will pass it to uh, Steve. Okay, Steve Savitsky, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Savitsky. I use he, him, and I am the uh, club coordinator for physics and uh, math students at Northeastern. My background uh, is uh, that number one, I am a proud Husky alum. Uh, went, uh, went to uh, Northeastern a few short years ago. And I have a, a career services uh, background in advising and employee relations roles over the past several years and have been, uh, had the great opportunity to return to Northeastern two and a half years ago. So I'm gonna tell you about co-op, the uh, uh, hallmark piece of the Northeastern education. This gives you an opportunity to take what you're learning in the classroom and build hands-on experience in your field uh, you can build up your network with contacts that can uh, help you uh, figure out career direction, graduate school, uh, what uh, types of positions that you're looking for, apply theory to practice, and ultimately discover where you find your passion. So uh, it's a fantastic program. I'm going to tell you how it works. And I did see in the chat that there was a question about examples of external co-ops, so that's definitely coming. So for a physics co-op, uh, you can begin, you can go on your first call as soon as your second semester of sophomore year. Uh, what you'll do the semester prior to going on your first co-op is complete the EESC 2000 Professional Development for Co-op course, which I teach. And that really gives you an opportunity to develop a college level resume, uh, work on interviewing skills, uh, get familiar with applying to uh, to co-ops in our AnyWorks uh, job and internship and co-op hosting board and give you the tools to uh, develop your own opportunities, whether through LinkedIn, some of the labs on campus and at some other institutions as well. Uh, we'll also give you uh, tools for uh, LinkedIn profile development, networking, so many different areas. It's a great course to kind of get you ready. So for co-op, uh, they're typically in a four to six month range and they fall on what are called the fall and spring cycles. The fall cycle starts in July, typically right after July 4th weekend and goes through December, uh, right up until the holidays and uh, uh, through the fall semester. The spring cycle typically starts in January, right after the new year and goes through June. So it'll encompass the spring uh, semester, which runs through April and then summer one, which is May and June for the fall, summer two is July and August, fall, September through December. Students typically will go on two to three co-ops throughout their education. Uh, the first co-op uh, oftentimes, uh, but not always an on-campus research lab of sorts, uh, just to really be able to dive into a particular experience and then kind of take that out into industry or vice versa. And of course, some students go full on into the research, especially if they're thinking of going directly into a PhD after or go full on into industry. And there's a number of places where students have uh, completed global co-ops. Uh, Professor Williams mentioned earlier on at CERN, Switzerland and France, right on, on the border. Uh, Italy, I'm gonna uh, point out an opportunity that is actually active now uh, in Italy shortly. Uh, Japan, the UK, Hong Kong, mainland China, Netherlands, Spain and Germany amongst many other places. So with that, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the sample companies. Okay, let me, I want to interrupt and say that the, the, the pictures on the left here are actually all examples of students on co-op. And those are international co-ops too that you can see on the left. And okay, so now I'll get you to the next slide, Steve. <laughs> oh, absolutely, thank you for pointing that out, for sure, for sure. So you'll see here a variety of companies and one of the places, uh, things that's really growing is you have uh, Selects Diagnostics, uh, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, uh, Boston Children's uh, around the biomedical physics major and developing uh, medical devices and uh, therapeutics. So that's, that's a huge thing in a growing area. 
you'll see uh, Harvard Medical School uh, and the uh, University of Milan Department of Physics. Those are some examples of places to do uh, very specific research uh, for physics. Uh, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan has hosted physics co-ops in the past. Uh, MKS instruments uh, and analogic systems uh, with MKS on the medical device side of things, whether it's uh, for uh, MRI machines, laser and optics, and for analogic, uh, one thing that is definitely coming back, airport security screening. So the design behind those systems, they, they need physics students to put those together. Uh, E-Ink is another very popular one. As, as you might know, 3D printing has become a huge industry and physics majors are definitely in demand there. Uh, and of course, we mentioned CERN before. And then uh, popping over to the left, you'll see Bose. Not only do they make some excellent headphones and speakers, but they make excellent co-op opportunities, especially for designing acoustics and in the physics music space. So this is just a snapshot of some of the companies and the labs uh, where physics students are, uh, are completing co-ops and have completed co-ops. And uh, definitely as we go through the evening, happy to answer more questions about them. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so next what we're going to do is um, go to the, the students where you can really find out what it's like for the students here. So let me uh, stop sharing this. Uh, and so, uh, Jennifer, you're up first. Sure. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm a fifth year applied physics and math major. Um, I'm from Tennessee, um, and I've done three co-ops. My first one was at A123 Systems, which is a company in Waltham, which is right outside of Boston. Um, it was working in the R&D section um, for um, lithium ion battery materials that go into electric vehicles. Um, and that one was actually a chemical engineering co-op um, because especially if you're trying to get a position in industry, there aren't a lot of positions that are labeled um, for physicists. But the thing is that we have a lot of the skills that are needed for you know, engineering and computer science co-ops. So it, there's like no problem getting positions. Um, my second one was international, it was in Japan. Um, so Steve mentioned the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. I went there for my second one and I was working in the quantum material science unit on my daddy's film films. Um, those can be used for information storage in the future. And my third one was this past year and it was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, it was virtual, but I was working on modeling for fuel cells. Um, so I actually chose mine very carefully because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in the future. And um, the main places that you go into if you want to have a research career are industry, national labs, and academia. So I had one co-op in each of those areas just to kind of fill out the differences in those settings. Um, and I'm graduating this semester. I'm actually about to commit to grad school today, I think. I'm going to go to Northwestern um, uh, Applied Physics PhD program and be working on uh, magnetic materials there with um, our Grand National Lab, actually. All right, that's great. Okay, so everyone, you'll have a chance to ask, ask questions, but let's hear from all the students first. So, Annika? Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to congratulate Jennifer for committing to Northwestern because that's news to yeah. me. <laughs> no one knows um, yet. I'm, I'm about to commit like tonight. So, you guys are the first one. All right. <laughs> well, we'll keep this our secret, the whole panel and all of the attendees. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Annika Padin. I am a second year sophomore applied physics student with minors in math, and I recently declared a minor in electrical engineering. Um, I am currently on my first co-op at E-Inc, which was one of the companies Steve just mentioned. Um, I am working in an electro optics lab as a technician. So um, E-Ink is like a display technology company primarily. Um, every single Kindle you've ever touched, like an Amazon Kindle with that like ink display, every single one was designed and manufactured by E-Ink. And they're one of our biggest customers and that's really cool. So I get to work on a lot of the metrology that goes into like perfecting those kind of displays and making the ink switch and we're working on color displays as well and it's cool to be involved in that i got all carried away um in terms of research i will also be doing a research project this summer with uh, professor louise scanari on the cms experiment um i won't actually be going 
to CERN or anything like that. Um, the CSF, CMS experiment is part of the Large Hadron Collider as part of CERN. And so I will be doing that completely virtually. And Oh, I'm also from New Jersey. I think I checked all the boxes. <laughs> Great. And so normally you would be going to CERN, right? It's just because of the COVID pandemic or is this a, I guess, um, it, I this guess is it could something be the way, right? I kind of like opted to make it a little mm -hmm. more flexible for myself because I think this research project is going to kind of carry into the fall and I'm going to be in classes. I also knew that Professor Scanari does a lot of computational based work. So that was kind of by my choice. But if someone were to take the co-op, I know they are trying to get students in person for this upcoming co-op cycle. Great. Okay. And, and thing, uh, I want, want to add as far as that, that global piece uh, is, uh, well, with the University of Milan, they've been very flexible in basically trying to form the upcoming experience so that it could be in person, but could very easily have a remote opportunity as well if that's still needed. So definitely lots of flexibility uh, across the globe for these co-ops. All right, thanks. Uh, so uh, last week, not, but not least, we have Karthik. Hi, I'm Karthik. Uh, I'm a fourth year math physics double major and bassoon performance minor. Uh, actually, I was late because rehearsal ran over. So um, I'm from Kentucky and uh, I guess I'm mainly interested on like the more theoretical physics side of things. Um, I'll be going to grad school in the fall uh, for, for math but I think I'll probably be doing a lot with uh, quantum theory and maybe quantum gravity potentially. Um, and as for co-ops, I, I did one that was in the math department, which was a research co-op uh, continuing, oh, it's dark, uh, continuing uh, an REU from the summer. And is there anything else I need to say? It's kind of brief, but. I also <laughs> realized all of us failed to talk about our positions on the e-board of SPS. So uh, Mark had mentioned <laughs> the Society of Physics Students. Um, Jennifer is the president currently, and Karthik is the vice president, and as they will be graduating. And I'm the current mentorship chair. We have a really well-built mentorship program where people incoming into the physics department, typically first years or transfers, will be paired up with an upper class member. And they're kind of there for you to help like answer questions that you kind of have like a buddy system. And then there's the whole mentorship community that you get to do cool things with and we get funding and hopefully free food if we're able to do in-person things this year. Yeah, so we normally have a meeting every Wednesday at noon um, in Egan. And so that's one of the research buildings on campus where a lot of the physics labs are. And we meet in the conference room and we always have free pizza. Um, and to graduate from the physics program, you have to give a talk about one of your co-ops to SPS. Um, so we have people coming in and giving talks all the time, and that's really helpful to see, um, you know, when you're at the beginning of your undergrad career, what options are available to you. Um, you can uh, network a lot with people, and that's actually how I got one of my co-ops. I saw a talk at SPS, and it's like, hey, that sounded really cool. How did you get started on that? Um, and there's one in Japan, so it's a lot more logistic stuff to figure out, so it's always good to meet people there. Um, and everybody is really nice. You won't see me or Carsey because we're graduating, but if you do join, um, Anika will be there. She's great. Um, yeah, we have a lot of fun. Um, I think they mentioned some of the events that we have, like pumpkin carving, um, and like pie day and chili cook-off. So there's always a lot of really fun department events that we have. Yeah, I wanted to add that it really says a lot about our students and your, the lead, your leadership and uh, the organization of SPS that you set up your own mentoring program uh, so that students could, could um, mentor each other. And that's, um, I think that's a very successful program. And, it, and it's, I think it's really helpful to have it run by the students. So you're pairing each other up. So that's, um, that's really great to see. Um, okay, so I think we're ready now to, um, to start taking questions. And Lauren, do you want to take over with the Great, thanks, Mark. Yes, um, thank you everyone for introducing yourselves and sharing a little bit with us. We have some great questions that are coming in. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Um, I, so, sorry to interrupt. I, I forgot our, our plan of action here was one that I wanted to also introduce the two people who have not spoken yet, but who may be answering questions. Sure, uh, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so we have Tim Sage. Uh, he is the faculty advisor. And Kim, you wanna just introduce yourself? 
uh, yeah, I'm Tim Sage. I'm the president of the physics department and also the uh, faculty advisor for the physics students. One of the number of advisors that we, that we give them. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tim. And then uh, Alina Mack. Hi, everybody. I'm the um, program uh, coordinator for the department, and I work with the um, undergrad students. Okay, great. So everyone else has spoken and introduced themselves. So uh, now we can go to Lauren. Sorry about that. Um, no, that's okay. I'm glad they, they were introducing themselves um, because I'm going to go to them next. And I think I may start with Alina here just because um, Tim, there was a little bit of an audio um, issue on my end. So Alina, we have a question that came in. Can AP physics credits be used by physics majors to um, get out of some of the introductory courses to place ahead? Yes, um, there's, there's a couple of exams. You, for physics majors, um, you, wanna, you wanna take the uh, physics C exams, not the physics one or two, because the, those will give you credit. Physics one and two AP exams will give you credit for the um, algebra-based um, physics. And that's not what our, our majors need to take. So you, you take the um, physics C exams and you, if you get the uh, four or five score, then you can test out of um, physics one or physics one and two. And Alina, just to um, clarify on that, what about if a student has, let's say, calculus credit or if they have um, credit for another requirement in your major, but it might not be physics specifically? Um, yeah, the, uh, the, that would be accepted too. Um, for To get out of um, physics, to, to go into physics uh, two, um, you would need uh, you would need to be taking calculus two at the same. Well, yeah, to, to be in calculus in physics two, you need to be in um, calculus two as well. So if you test out of um, calc one and physics one, then you can go into physics two. If you test out of physics two and calc two, then you can move on to um, modern, which is like a, it's kind of like physics three. Excellent, thanks. And just as a reminder, um, all students who come through our orientation will have a chance to talk with academic and faculty advisors um, about their specific AP credit or IB credit, where, whatever they may be bringing in. Um, there is a question that just came in, will CLEP exams count as credits? Unfortunately, we do not um, offer CLEP exams at Northeastern. However, we do offer challenge exams, which are new. Um, and these are um, opportunities for students, maybe if you didn't get AP credits, that you can take a challenge exam at Northeastern. And more information will be going out to students after the deposit deadline. Okay, um, let's go over to Professor Williams. Can you discuss what percentage of classes are taught by professors and what percentage are taught by um, students? Right, I assume they mean uh, the the graduate, graduate students, <laughs> typically a lot of universities have a lot of courses that are taught by graduate students, but not at Northeastern. Basically all of our classes are taught by, uh, by faculty except the labs. So the, the introductory physics labs, um, the instructors, there's an overall, you know, faculty, there are faculty who head the, the labs themselves and design them and oversee them, but, um, but teaching assistants who are graduate students are the ones that are supervising the introductory physics lab. But other than that, any class that you take, that's a, a class involving a lecture or group work or, or any of that, those are all run by, by faculty. Excellent. That was a really great question. So thank you um, to yeah. our audience member for that one. All right, Karthik, you have um, a question specifically coming to you to discuss a little bit more about what you um, are studying. So you had said you are double major in physics as well as mathematics. Um, and how have your um, co-ops tied into the theoretical side of what you're doing? Well, the co-op specifically uh, was kind of more just pure math, um, but I've taken some graduate courses, for example, a math, met math methods of quantum mechanics, which was actually in the math department, but it was about um, quantum field theory uh, from the math side of things. And yeah, uh, and I took quantum mechanics at an earlier time. There was statistical, statistical mechanics, I cannot speak today, uh, which is also pretty math intensive. So all of it uh, was, I guess, mathematically 
satisfactory, if you will. Um, and I very much would like to continue with uh, things that are physics related whenever I go on to uh, more, I don't know, high level things uh, with math. Excellent, thanks so much. We have a few questions that are coming in with co-op, so I wanna um, stay on this topic for a minute. Jennifer, um, can you talk a little bit about um, what your personal experience was applying for co-ops and how hard was it to get the co-ops that you really wanted? Okay, so I, it's gonna depend. I got really lucky and I got all of my top co-ops. I don't know if that's common. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I got really, really lucky and I planned it out really carefully, like I said before, with what I wanted to have experience in. Um, you know, not everybody has to be like that. You can just try out things and see if you like it. Um, I think that's how most people are. I, I was just like very, very systematic about what I was choosing. Um, for my first one, I went through uh, Northeastern's like co-op database um, and you can filter it by like position, location, major. Um, and so I just applied to a lot of positions through there and um, got one. So my second one that was um, in Japan, no, actually Ash answered the question that someone had about um, a broad co-op. Um, so for that one, it's kind of unique also because I didn't have to know Japanese because the university always is an English speaking university. Um, they did offer me a Japanese course that I got to take there because um, I didn't come and knowing anything just so I could survive living in Japan. But for the research and position itself, it was um, not required at all. Um, so I think I have some friends who have done co-ops at CERN and in Italy. Um, I'm not, I think like both of those places um, are also like largely English speaking. Um, so I think it's going to depend like where you want to go. Um, but I found that like most people don't need to be fluent in the language of the country that they're going to. Um, so for that one was kind of through Northeastern because the OIST is listed in the database. Um, but I applied to a specific group and reached out to the professor directly and asked if he would be willing to take on an intern. So I somewhat self-developed that one. Um, and so you can work with Steve and we also have a, a designated global co-op advisor um, so you can work with both of them to figure out all the logistics. And then my third one, since it was at a national lab and the government has like their own internship system, I did have to kind of self-develop that and apply through their website and everything, but it was super easy to count that um, towards the Northeastern Co-op credit. Um, it was just like not through the database. Great, thanks for all that information. Um, and Steve, can I actually have you uh, chime in here as well? Um, when you are advising students on, um, you know, making their list of jobs or co-op jobs to apply to you, what are some of the guidance that you give them for a realistic um, perspective? So first and foremost, you know, co-op is part of lifelong uh, career journey and exploration. So I encourage students to be open-minded about not necessarily uh, needing to go for that dream co-op first and foremost, uh, but to really think about what are they looking for out of the experience, not just uh, the, 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 um, uh, what the research in the lab is or the industry that they're going into. Let's say they wanted to uh, work uh, on uh, medical devices, but what are, just break down the components of the different positions that they, that they like and know that uh, two things that, that I find is uh, not to be intimidated by not being qualified for everything on a job description. You definitely wanna throw your hat in the ring for a variety of positions. Uh, the employers that are hiring co-ops know that it's a learning experience and that, and that they're, not, uh, they're not necessarily expecting the students to have every little thing on the description. So you wanna make sure that you, uh, you keep an open mind to the positions that you apply to. Uh, if you are gonna self-develop with a professor, whether on or off campus, uh, definitely take the time to do the research and I can, I can uh, help you with this uh, when you're taking the class with me and in advising sessions on really crafting a plan for what you wanna learn because uh, if you're going to go for something very specific, uh, you want to come prepared to be able to say why and make your case uh, to develop the opportunity. So I would say that as well. I mean, my general guidelines would also be to uh, uh, 
you know, own the experience that you come in with. Uh, if you uh, worked uh, at a, a restaurant or retail or what have you, or in tutoring uh, in high school and in college and coming up to this point, those are going to be some transferable skills that will make you a strong candidate in a lot of places. So uh, definitely want to lean into that. And I uh, know that you have, uh, you have a couple uh, different tries to really see what you like and don't like. You don't have to get it right on the first go around. Uh, my general recommendation is to do at least one co-op in industry. But of course, uh, if you, uh, if, if you are, have a specific area of research that you want to go into prepare for PhD, then uh, we can help you uh, develop a, uh, that specific research. So that's, that's my advice there. And definitely uh, encourage students to, uh, you know, just uh, put the time into the class and uh, talk to each other in a class, get to know uh, what your peers are doing, go to SPS. That is a very, uh, that is very helpful. Not, not just the pizza that'll hopefully come back in person, but very, uh, very uh, helpful uh, sessions. And, and I will say, uh, that um, I, I went to several of those meetings uh, when they're in person and have gone to the virtual ones and lots of great guidance there too. Wonderful. Thanks for all that um, added information, Steve. Um, I would like to go to Annika actually, um, because this is a really good segue. As um, you said in your intro, as well as Steve just now, um, you aren't always going to be applying for a co-op position that says quote unquote physics on it. And Annika, you said you were, you had applied and um, did a co-op with a chemical engineering um, position. Can you so talk actually about that was Jennifer. I'm sorry to oh, interrupt I'm sorry, you. that was Jennifer. It's not a problem. Actually, the co-op I'm working in right now um, is geared towards physics majors and electrical engineering majors. So That's I can That's where I was going it. with it. <laughs> But uh, also, can you talk a little bit about when you decided to do your electrical engineering minor? How did that develop mm -hmm. in your, the course of your experience? Yeah, um, so funny enough, I declared that minor last week. It was from my experience in my co-op. I was really enjoying a lot of the like hands-on circuitry type work I was doing in my lab. Um, and I decided I wanted to learn more about it and have a minor that kind of could speak for those skills. Uh, when I was first applying to schools, I think I was a little between whether I wanted to do like physics or engineering. And Northeastern has so many options in terms of that. If you want to do combined, if you want to do double, if you want to do a minor like me. I know people who have taken so many paths in terms of that. And there's a lot of flexibility if you change your mind but I ended up um, applying to Northeastern as an applied physics major because I thought that was kind of a middle ground for me and I was more interested in the physics side whereas if you did a combined major with say mechanical engineering and physics it would be a lot more focused in mechanical engineering but I was more interested in physics. Um, so then I I guess as I kind of got here and started taking my physics classes, I found I was, you know, still very interested in the physics side and confirmed that for me. And then I kind of revisited engineering because I also didn't know quite which engineering field I might be interested in initially. And I think it was my experience with co-op that was really able to like solidify that for me. Excellent. Thanks so much. And thank you mm -hmm. for keeping me honest with that, with the electrical engineering, not coming. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, Karthik, I am going to go to you um, for, we only have a couple more minutes left um, here, but can you discuss the opportunity to take courses um, for Northeastern students in general and for physics students outside of their major? Um, I know you're doing a double major, so your courses might have been a little bit more prescribed, um, but will students be able to take fun courses that they're interested in while they're at Northeastern? Uh, I mean, I feel like that's what I've been doing most of my time here. Uh, maybe I'm not the best person to ask uh, because I don't know, I, I tend to enjoy my courses. <laughs> But I was that's not say, the yeah, took just math classes for his fun classes. Um, that's a great I also, point. <laughs> um, I also double major with math, but I actually picked that up because the applied physics major is very flexible. Um, but I also took classes in um, mechanical engineering, um, uh, sustainable energy. I went on a dialogue to Brazil for that. Um, I had a lot of room to try out different areas of engineering. 
Um, I've also taken a few philosophy courses um, and you might get some of those just through the core requirements at Northeastern. Uh, I took an architecture course to fulfill some of those. Um, so, you know, I've not just taken math and science classes. Yeah, like I'm taking music and religion right now. And of course we had our writing courses and I also had a philosophy course uh, way at the beginning. Um, and actually something about a previous question that was asked that Steve reminded me of, uh, there is a there are a lot of opportunities for a physics related research in the math department, like Professor Beasley, for one, he's actually a physics PhD, I believe. And he uh, just does, uh, again, quantum field theory kind of research. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in theoretical physics, to look in both departments because there's quite a bit of overlap. Excellent, thank you. And um, I am gonna go back over to Dr. Williams. Um, we have just a, a few more minutes here. Um, there was a question that came in for pre-med students. Is physics a good place for students who are interested in medicine? Yes, I just finished typing in the answer to that person, but we have a pre-med track to the biomedical physics major. Uh, and so there's a, it's sort of a natural way uh, to do that. But physics in general, even if you don't do biomedical physics is excellent preparation. Uh, and I think, you know, showing that you can do a physics major is really powerful uh, for showing that you're capable of being a pre-med. And, and there's of course a general college of science mechanism for helping preparing people. And you can be in, in lots of different majors to do that, but physics is definitely a good major uh, for pre-med. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we do see physics majors usually every year applying into medical school. So thank you for answering that. Um, I am actually gonna bounce this back. Any final thoughts or words that you would like to share with our um, audience today? Is that back to me? Back to you. <laughs> okay, and well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Well, you know, I really look forward to, to, to as many as you as possible coming uh, to the department. Uh, we have a great program. And uh, as you can see from the students who spoke here today, we have many other students who have had a great experience and SPS and everything that we have to offer uh, really gives you a, a good experience to help you figure out what you want to do and give you the tools to do it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, for those words, I want to thank everyone who participated in this session, um, to our faculty, uh, staff, and especially our students. You are great ambassadors for the college and the Department of Physics. Um, so with that, we are going to have to close for this evening. Um, if students have any further questions, please do reach out. Um, everyone is able to get in touch with me via text. Um, I am the not the non-bot human that is answering the text messages. So we can connect you with the physics department if you have questions. Um, with that, I'd like to say good evening to everyone and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.